Well, hello, everyone. Uh, we are very grateful for your patience as multiple people realize that I am not the technological person at ASRM. Um, thank you all for, for staying around and, and we are gonna, we are going to get started. <laughs> um, I am Jesse Loesch. I'm the government affairs manager at the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Um, my incredible colleague and counterpart at SMFM, Samantha Berg, is on as well. Um, and we are really grateful and delighted um, that we get to hear from a pretty remarkable and impressive group of panelists, also a patient group of panelists. Uh, thank you all. I will be asking for your cookie choices later so I could bribe you and thank you for dealing with my um, technology this morning. So um, we will spotlight our panelists as they speak, but I'm just gonna give a little round of intros. Um, we are also going to be using the Q&A feature down at the bottom. Um, and then at the end, we will be answering your questions. So feel free to post your questions in the Q&A as we go. Um, joining Samantha and me is ASRM president, Dr. Michael Thomas. Um, Dr. David Hackney, who has been working in Ohio on the ballot amendment that we're going to hear about. Dr. Marcella Acevedo, who's one of the founders for Ohio Physicians for Reproductive Rights. And Daniel Ortiz was the ledge director for Ohio Physicians for Reproductive Rights. So we really have um, a, a widespread group here who's going to be able to give us some information on what's happening on the ground in Ohio and why your voices and your advocacy are so important. Um, let's go ahead and get started since I took up a whole bunch of our time getting everybody in here before. So, Sam, if you don't mind going to the next slide, that would be great. And I am just going to pin or spotlight Dr. Acevedo to take it away for us. Hi folks, my name is Marcel Acevedo. I'm the founder and the president of this new organization, the Ohio Physicians, Physicians for Reproductive Rights. Um, we've been uh, going strong and busy in advocacy and legislative work um, since the summer of last year. Um, a little bit about um, abortion in Ohio, uh, like many states um, that um, uh, tends to have some conservative voters. Uh, we've had a legislature that has been passing more and more restrictive abortion uh, bills and laws um, in Ohio for um, a solid while now. Um, some of, of these um, are passed and in effect, and some of these um, have been blocked um, in court. Um, so in 2013, um, that was um, when we passed some of our earlier uh, viability testing um, laws in where uh, doctors were required uh, to test and given writing um, cardiac activity, embryonic activity, and counsel patients um, on the statistical likelihood um, that they could carry a pregnancy to term even though that they were there for um, a, a, an abortion. Um, and it both um, uh, um, applied uh, possible uh, misdemeanor charges uh, when such was not appropriately documented um, with up to anywhere around six to 18 months jail, um, as well as a possible fourth degree felony uh, when these violations were not, uh, or these violations um, were done. Um, at the same time, trap laws uh, went into effect around that time as well. Um, and these are not different than many trap laws in other states, um, which further restricted um, our ability to care for patients uh, when uh, certain requirements such as agreements between clinics um, um, and hospitals, as well as admitting privileges by doctors performing um, abortions uh, were in requirement. So those are, yes, thank you, Jesse. Those are the targeted restrictions on abortion providers um, and they're in effect in, in various states, uh, not just in Ohio. Um, in 2019 uh, was when Government Mike Dwine passed uh, the Heartbeat Protection Act, um, which was uh, um, essentially prohibited um, abortion um, after six weeks, um, essentially just cardiac activity, uh, which is marked as around six weeks. Um, and so we essentially called it the, the, the heartbeat ban um, in Ohio. Um, that was passed, but under Roe v. Wade, it wasn't um, actually enacted. Um, however, when the Dobbs decision came down, last year, um, 
that was essentially a trigger law in Ohio. And so just a mere two to three hours later, our attorney general had filed things in motion for that law to be in effect. It was in effect for approximately eight, 11 weeks up until the um, ACLU of Ohio um, filed um, a lawsuit against that, and it was blocked in a lower court. Um, and so we've had an injunction on that heartbeat ban um, since about September 15th of 2002. So it was in action for July, August, and most of September. Um, and since then, um, it's been blocked. So as of right now, um, in Ohio, um, uh, we are under essentially the same um, laws that we were under um, before Dobbs came down. Um, in 2020, uh, we did have um, an abortion remains disposal um, bill that passed. Um, and uh, that bill essentially uh, requires um, uh, patients that have abortions uh, that are 11 weeks or later uh, to dispose of, of remains, uh, fetal remains. Um, that bill um, is currently blocked um, and awaiting litigation, so it is not yet um, in effect. Uh, OPRR then um, essentially formed um, um, at uh, the Dobbs decision um, at the end of June um, last year, mostly because we had a pretty biased um, uh, governing body um, that was very anti-abortion, uh, Government Mike DeWine, um, as well as the majority um, in Senate uh, were um, anti-abortion. We were also surrounded by folks um, who had an anti-abortion stance, including our Attorney General, including the Supreme Court of Ohio, which is actually an elected body um, in Ohio, um, as well as um, as the ballot board. And so being surrounded by folks who were anti-abortion, uh, passing anything through the legislature was not going to be um, a uh, anything that was feasible um, in Ohio, um, anything that was pro-choice. And so OPRR took on the role of um, gathering um, the necessary infrastructure and the necessary uh, things to move on with a citizen-led um, ballot initiative uh, to uh, restore productive freedom um, in our state. And I'll take the next slide. And so what we've been doing thus far, um, first and foremost, was building the infrastructure in our coalition. We spent most of the fall um, essentially establishing an infrastructure um, or nonprofit organization, along with a political action committee, um, uh, getting the right lawyers um, involved, which were both constitutional lawyers, but as well as uh, reproductive rights lawyers that have been working with the ACLU throughout uh, the past many years. Um, it was also building um, the... Uh, the persuasion phase of it, um, uh, getting in political strategists um, as well as polling firms um, to help with um, essentially the uh, the background infrastructure, like what does it mean to put a citizen-led ballot initiative um, in a state, um, and is this feasible, and can it be done uh, within the, the time period that we want it to be done, which was essentially a year because our goal was to put this on the ballot this year. Um, instead of in uh, 2024, uh, because we knew that the, um, that the injection on the heartbeat bin uh, was going to run out sometime in the middle of 2023. And then an entire year without abortion access uh, to our patients was not acceptable um, by our standards. And so most of the fall was spent building that infrastructure and getting and all the folks involved that needed to be involved, um, the further stakeholders like Planned Parenthood, Preterm Ohio, Pro-Choice Ohio, ACLU, um, a lot of uh, other freedom and democracy defenders that would uh, be on our side uh, when it came uh, to whether or not uh, we should have um, um, uh, access to abortion in Ohio. Um, once we had all the lawyers in place um, and we had research uh, that showed us what Ohioans would vote for, what Ohioans um, uh, could allow in our constitution, um, we used some of the amendment from the Michigan uh, language um, and as well as based on the polling that we had done to author um, an amendment that would allow as much reproductive freedom as possible, but yet still be passable in a conservative state like Ohio. This was also tested um, against um, voters um, and eventually was certified by the attorney general as um, as appropriately summarized. And it was so it was certified by the ballot board as a single issue um, amendment. We then undertook uh, uh, the the hefty goal of gathering signatures, which in Ohio 
It essentially meant that we needed 10% of all of the voters from the last gubernatorial election to approve of such an amendment. <laughs> And that meant a little over 413,000 signatures. And in 12 weeks, uh, we gathered 700,000 signatures uh, to be able to put this on the ballot um, in Ohio. And this was certified by the Secretary of State as well. Um, other things that we've accomplished is that in the entire time that we've been doing this, we have a pretty fierce um, <laughs> opposition um, that is fueled by their um, own personal beliefs. Um, and they've... Uh, undergone multiple attempts to try to defeat this. Um, we've um, been in constant litigation with them. There have been two separate attempts, one that um, that accused um, our amendments to have more than one issue within it um, and so that it would be not valid. And uh, the one issue is that they did not think that reproductive freedom was a single thing and that we needed to have separate amendments for um, abortion and for in vitro fertilization and for contraception. And so this was litigated in court um, and the Supreme Court of Ohio did uh, dismiss this case. Um, so we were successful in that one. And then um, the most recent one was um, that they did try to toss out our ability to be on the ballot um, in November as well by essentially saying that <clears throat> our amendment needed to have stated um, all of the rules that it would negate. For example, will, would it negate the heartbeat bill ban wouldn't negate the trap laws, wouldn't negate any of these other laws in Ohio that had been uh, passed previously. <laughs> Through our litigation, um, that uh, the uh, the Ohio Supreme Court also tossed that out um, because there hadn't been any legal precedent um, to side with that before either. And most recently, the special election, um, there, um, which were the most recent um, attempts to thwart the rules for citizen-led ballot initiatives. And so I'll take the next slide. So this was essentially um, issue one in August of 2023. So as um, the signature collection was uh, gathering a lot of steam and we pretty clearly had uh, strong support from most of, of Ohioans um, on the Reproductive Freedom Amendment, uh, the folks in the legislature um, who were seeing this as being a pretty successful campaign um, added on an, an additional hurdle, and, and that is that they created an additional election that just last year themselves they had um, decided that it was unconstitutional to throw special elections in because they both wasted money um, and had a pretty low voter turnout, in fact, less than 5% of all eligible voters um, vote in special elections in Ohio. But in such, in such, they put in a special election just ahead of the November election um, that asked that all citizen-led constitutional amendments both needed to, instead of reaching a simple majority of 50%, they needed to reach a super majority of 60% in order to pass. Moreover, the requirements completely changed for further citizen led ballot initiatives to um, being more stringent, meaning instead of gathering from 44 counties, Ohio has 88 counties, we would be required to gather um, from all um, 88 counties. Um, so really this was an attempt to change the rules of our democracy um, in order to prevent uh, the Reproductive Freedom Amendment from being on the ballot. But of course, it would have also affected the entire uh, future of democracy in Ohio. And truly, um, this was um, essentially put on the uh, on the on the August um, ballot um, uh, as late as around May. It was around May or June uh, when uh, this uh, special election was allowed. And we truly had a record voter turnout, somewhere over 40% of eligible voters um, came out to vote on this issue on a special election in an odd year in Ohio. So it was a um, <clears throat> pretty remarkable voter turnout um, and issue one did fail. And so we are, as of right now, under our general rules, which is obtaining a simple majority um, for a citizen-led ballot, uh, ballot initiative. Um, next slide. Here soon, as we had expected um, earlier last year, uh, the six-week ban um, is going to go uh, from the lower courts to um, be heard in the Ohio Supreme Court, and that's happening September 27th, um, and excuse me. I'm in the hospital, very dry air. Um, 
And essentially, um, the injunction here essentially says that um, that the six week ban um, does not um, uphold the principles of equality and uh, and the principles of self governance that um, we have that are not specifically stated in our constitution, but that are implied. And so it's essentially a um, a lawsuit by the ACLU of Ohio, and. We um, are uncertain of how the Ohio Supreme Court um, is going to decide on it. We do know that it is an elected conservative su Supreme Court and uh, the majority of those judges have in one way or another um, been cited to be anti-abortion in general um, prior to their um, their current terms. Um, and we will essentially see where, where things go here. Um, the general expectation is that they are um, not going to uphold the injunction, but there is a possibility that they will. Um, regardless, this is the one, um, the one law that we know would be annulled uh, by the Reproductive Freedom Amendment um, if it passes in November. Next slide. And so the ballot measure, what does it say? Um, so um, uh, this is a, a small sentence out of uh, the amendment itself. It's 194 words. You can read the whole thing for yourself. It's on readtheamendments.com. Um, and that will give you a good sense of what it says. But it essentially says that uh, people have the right to um, their, to make their own reproductive decisions, um, including but not limited to contraception, fertility treatment, uh, miscarriage, care, abortion, continuing one's, one's own pregnancy up to the moment of viability, which would be decided by uh, the medical professional. Um, and it also says that the state shall not burden or penalize or prohibit or interfere with this right. So that's what our ballot measure says. Um, and as of recent, the ballot board, they write something separate. So what voters actually see when they go on uh, on the voting booth is not the amendment. It's not the, the amendment that was written um, by our lawyers and that has been tested on voters and that is research-based. They see what the Secretary of State plus um, the other four members of the ballot board decide um, is a fair summary of this. Um, and it, in our case, it happens to be pretty um, pretty biased, um, full of political propaganda and full of medically inaccurate, inaccurate as well as uh, constitutional law inaccurate um, verbiage, uh, which is meant to, you know, incite uh, emotional feelings towards voting no on the amendment. And so uh, that's a pretty important thing to say out loud that here in Ohio right now, we're dealing with what voters are going to see, uh, which does not reflect what is actually going to go in the constitution, does not accurately reflect the amendment. And so um, that recently happened here. So we'll take the next slide. Um, and uh, the most important thing that's recently happened is that we we did file um, a lawsuit. Um, and by us, I mean the Ohio's United for Reproductive Rights. And we are the coalition of multiple organizations that have been working on this ballot initiative nonstop since last summer. And um, in this lawsuit, um, it essentially says that, hey, um, there's a lot of political garbage in here. It is propaganda. We should throw out the summary that is, in fact, longer than the actual amendment itself and just put the amendment itself for voters to see. Um, so that is uh, one of the things that are ongoing right now for us. Um, and next slide, and just to kind of summarize really where we are, uh, what our laundry list really is, is that yes, we're going to be litigating this amendment um, as uh, uh, li litigating this ballot language um, uh, here in the future. It should go on by uh, the third week of September, um, where we should have hopefully real and accurate and reflective uh, language for the amendment. Uh, we are doing hefty work on, on research, on figuring out how to message appropriately to our voters, as well as uh, continuing to work as a coalition and uh, mobilizing um, both volunteers <clears throat> and all organizations that want or can be a part of this uh, to get voter turnout and voter persuasion on voting yes on, on the Reproductive Freedom Amendment. And so a lot of that um, is uh, doing ads, mailings, but also getting more physicians involved. This is one thing that we um, certainly talk to our healthcare um, colleagues about um, is the, uh, the the general concept of you know how much trust there is in healthcare providers and abortion providers and and in medical professionals in general uh, when it comes to this topic and that the more support that we can prove um, that we have uh, the the more valid uh, this amendment becomes as a true healthcare amendment rather than um, you know 
political bias from other organizations that might be uh, more politically partisan. Okay. And so uh, if uh, you're interested in this, um, we certainly, um, we uh, Daniel Ortiz would drop a link in here um, if you'd like to endorse the amendment and or join the effort um, as well as uh, donate to the effort. Um, and thank you. I'll pass uh, it along to, I think, David's next. I actually, I think um, we're going to pass it to Dr. Thomas, who's going to speak exactly to what you just talked about, Dr. Acevedo, the importance of uh, providers as advocators. Yes. Yeah, just... um... Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here in my role as the president of ASRM. As you know, ASRM has a long tradition of being very strong in uh, advocate advocacy. Uh, we work with patient advocacy groups on all aspects. Obviously, we're primarily known as an infertility group because a lot of these laws affect our infertility patients, uh, whether they write it in there now or not. And, and I guess from my standpoint, my uh, thought is that we need to always uh, continue to be advocates. Advocates are people of uh, who have the expertise uh, in the field to go out and talk to uh, not only patients, but also legislators and also uh, insurance companies uh, to try to advocate for our patients. Our clinician advocacy is part of the authority. We do have the uh, uh, expertise and the uh, 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 gravitas, if you will, uh, to talk to people who would affect uh, women's rights in a negative way. Because when we talk about some of these bills uh, that are being uh, uh, placed out there for patients, they, it could be very confusing because I know that in Ohio, some of these bills are very confusing. And, and, and one of the things that uh, need to be done from our standpoint is to let patients know exactly what's going on and serve as the authorities in these reproductive health areas. Uh, we as uh, providers also have a personal connection with patients. Uh, so letting patients understand that we would not want anything that would hamper the uh, provider-patient relationship and advocating against anything that would uh, uh, stand in the way of that is going to be very important. And it's also the responsibility of providers to make absolutely sure uh, that uh, we do everything to inform our patients to and, and inform the public in general to let them know that uh, these type of intrusions into the provider-patient relationship just won't stand. Uh, so that we at ASRM are, are clearly against anything that would come in the way of uh, impinging on that provider-patient relationship, uh, whether it comes to contraceptive care, infertility care, abortion care, or anything uh, that would impact or, or have a negative uh, effect on uh, that patient uh, provider relationship. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. And now we get to hear from Dr. Hackney. I so, apologize. I'm going to try to spotlight you as well. It's working. Okay. Um, thank, thank you. There were, um, you know, many uh, different ways I could take this. So a, a week or so ago, I reached out to SMFM and said, you know, what would be the best things to uh, cover? And they nicely sort of uh, pr provided the following. How long have you been advocating? Why uh, have you contributed? And why are provider, you know, voices important? So I started to think about the first question, how long? And I thought back to 2019. 2019, of course, is not that long ago, but it feels like a totally different um, era. You know, it was before COVID, it was before Dobbs. And um, I was pointing out what was important in Ohio was 2019 was when SB 23, uh, the draconian abortion law, which would later go into effect in 2022, 2019 was when it was uh, voted on, moved through our legislative bodies and was um, signed. So when thinking about this question, I actually remember that back in 2019, I had written a um, op-ed against SB 23 in the uh, Columbus Dispatch. So I was curious, having not read it in a long time. So I went back and pulled it somewhat nervously. You're always a little bit nervous reading things that you wrote, you know, years and years um, in the past. So this was my 2019 opposite session um, essay to uh, SB 
uh, 23. And it's not, it's not bad. I mean, there wasn't anything in it that I feel embarrassed about now. You know, it also definitely didn't have a sort of, for lack of a better description, you know, fire um, to it. To be frank, in 2019, I, you know, a lot of us, I think, were in denial about what was coming down the road. You know, I, I would not have thought in 2019 that SB 23, with all of its horrors, would actually have had become the um the uh, law you know i don't know what i actually would have written in 2019 if i could have seen into the future you, you know at that um at that time but you know the next question why do you advocate so i read back through you know my 2019 editorial um recently and you know in i i realized my reasons are still largely the same, you know, this was the conclusion of my piece on SB 23 in 2019. And, you know, I talk about how, you know, the law will probably be held under injunction. Hopefully it'll be under injunction uh, forever. That was sadly not the case, but it'd be hanging over our head. And then I said, this environment may deter physicians from practicing in Ohio. I practice in Ohio despite these restrictions and because our access to medical care should not depend on our geography. Being in a battleground state like Ohio affords me the opportunity to fight for my patients. It would be easy to retreat to one of the coasts, but this part of the country is where I grew up and trained and will continue to practice. And as we stand here in uh, you know 2023, I, I would say this is basically the same. I mean, writing that in 2019, I certainly did not know what was coming down the pike uh, for us and the actual fight that we would be in. And you know, in June 2022, when SB 23 became the law, and MFMs, you know, OBJNs in the country were staring down uh, potential criminal jeopardy, you know, you, you did have to pause to think if we were in the right place. But now in 23, with everything full steam um, ahead with the ballot initiative, thanks to the tremendous work of the folks in OPRR and others, there's really no other state I would um, want to be in at the moment. Ohio right now is where the fight is. Um, of course, fast forward, you know, you did have the Dobbs decision in 2022. And then, you know, I wrote this piece for the New York Times. And again, sort of thinking about this lecture, you know, you, you have this piece post-Dobbs and you have my editorial in 2019, you know, and substantively, they're very similar. The fundamental arguments are the same, but, you know, the emotions of the two different pieces are a far cry from one another, you know, because things being you know, hypothetical versus actually things being the lived experience that you're um, going through at the uh, time. Um, how have you contributed? You know, this one, of course, makes us, I, I don't know, you always feel a little bit uncomfortable with, with this one. Um, it's always uh, uncomfortable to sort of um, talk about yourself or your own accomplishments, you know, so I guess I will briefly mention, and I don't know if this is a contribution on my part, but I have been sued twice. The, um, both of which I was under no sort of, you know, jeopardy um, at all, as was um, alluded to in Ohio, a ballot initiative uh, sort of, and I'm not a lawyer, I may not be explaining this correctly, but sort of formally exists as the committee representing the petitioners, which is five people. But one of the implications is that if you are suing, quote unquote, the ballot, initiative, you are technically seeing uh, the five people on the uh, committee. Of course, you know, so like in maternal fetal medicine, you know, um, lawsuits, litigation is what we think about and worry about on a day-to-day, -day, you know, uh, basis. But of course, this was not malpractice. You know, there was no personal jeopardy or anything to myself, or I was never at risk, though, though maybe a little bit of risk. So this was the March summons, which was circulated to the um, to the uh, media and available on the website. And this is my home address. So if anyone wants to come visit me after the uh, talk, that's uh, where I live. So I do get uh, the periodic weird letter in the uh, mail. But my wife is a doctor also. And um, when this one came, I realized I had forgotten to um, tell her about this. So I come home from work and there's this like manila folder sitting on the kitchen uh, table that says summons on it. And she's like, oh, I sorry, this came today. And then I kind of laughed and I said, oh no, this, this isn't what you think at all. This is something, uh, this is something wildly different. Um, but, you know, if we look at the time course of reproductive statewide elections, you know, of course, in uh, last year in 2022, there were statewide 
vote on the subject of abortion in uh, five states. They all passed in our uh, favor. 23, we're the only one. You know, one of the uh, fortunate aspects, again, of Ohio is that we do allow uh, citizen-initiated ballot initiatives in odd years. Many states require them to be in even years. And we're probably going to have a bunch in 24. I mean, it's still up in the air. Plus, um, I can't keep track of all the other, you know, states. But I, I think everything is looking like there'll be a number of votes in, you know, 2024. So I sort of like to use the analogy of the Spanish Civil War. So if you remember back to your history books, you had sort of like World War One, and you had World War Two, And in between was the Spanish Civil War, which you certainly don't want to say was trivial or small. It was obviously a horrific event, though also was not World War One or World War you know, two. And in the Spanish Civil War is where military strategists look back upon the mistakes which had been made in World War One and planned and trialed, you know, sort of did a dress rehearsal for some of the techniques that would be used in World War Two. So I, I kind of feel like Ohio right now is the Spanish Civil War. You know, what works in 23 in Ohio, um, you know, is what's going to be potentially rolled out in, um, you know, 2024. So, um, you know, what what is working right now? What's what's working less now? I would say one of our major advantages right now is that we are united under one roof and we are rowing in the same direction. Um, you know, there there is a long story of getting to this point, which is not worth getting into. But abortion rights supporters are by no means a monolith. You know, we have very diverse opinions. You know, we have diverse opinions, which we feel strongly, you know, about. And, you know, as many people probably know, the, the road to this point was a, you know, complicated road, including a road which is complicated within our, you know, field and sort of OBGYN. But the differences between us are always far smaller than what we have in uh, common. And the advantages of everyone being under a single roof, rowing in the same direction outweigh what differences um, may exist. And right now, you know, after a tremendous amount of work by a very large number of people, we are sitting in a uh, very good place, you know, a, a place I am, you know, sort of uh, thrilled to see us at, and I do believe are thus maximally uh, positioned, um, you know, moving, uh, moving forward as, as well. So, you know, why are provider voices important? Um, you know, if I was to look at this, the sort of our opponent's strat strategies, you know, uh, one was to, as was outlined before, to try to stop the amendment process itself, things appear to be, um, Moving uh, forward, uh, transphobia is a big uh, strategy at this point. But probably, you know, one one of the major issues, you know, uh, one of the strategies where they're already um, to a large extent coming out swinging is this concept of like elective term abortion. So this was a um, letter which came out to folks in Ohio to oppose the ballot initiative, and of course you have like you know. Um, cross-sex hormone treatment, you know, which is definitely not in the amendment and is obviously, um, you know, transphobic as well. But then you have this allow abortion through uh, nine months, the fantasy that, you know, one would ever be able to just discontinue a pregnancy at 40 weeks, you know, for no reason at all. As we all know, you know, that that has never happened, you know, that will, um, that will never happen, you know, and semantics being important, it is a a lie. And not only is it a lie, it is a dangerous lie, you know, because of the inflammatory nature of what is being raised. And not only is it a dangerous lie, it's a dangerous lie to me, you know, and fellow ob joans in the um, state, you know, the world has a lot of wacky you know, people in it. And you know, you don't know what the consequences of circulating a highly inflammatory lie of the state are going to be. So, you know, how does one attempt to combat this um, lie? You know, I think sort of specifically having ob joanne you know, doctors at the forefront saying like, no, you know, this, this does this not happen. This is not, you know, possible. This is not what the amendment says at all. And this will sort of, um, you know, never happen but um 
that's what I have. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, I have to say, I was curious where Spanish Civil War was going to fit in, and I was not disappointed. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, oh, sure. I had a little trouble hearing there, but. Oh, sorry. Um, so we now get to hear from Daniel Ortiz about more specific ways that people can take action and advocate. So let me spotlight you, Daniel. Great. Uh, so thanks for having me. So I am the field director for Ohio Physicians for Reproductive Rights. Uh, so in the spring, we were focused on gathering the signatures that we needed to make it onto the ballot. And then we kind of shifted. We had the, the wrench thrown in of the August election, and we were out uh, directing our volunteers to help get out the vote on that and successfully voted down uh, what was issue one in August. And now we are working on getting people to vote yes on issue one in November. Um, really fun stuff. So our our plan, uh, what our volunteers are out doing is just your typical uh, political field plan. We are knocking a lot of doors. We're making phone calls. We're sending text messages. We are getting people together to do uh, what's called relational organizing and having different, um, you know, parties where people get together and just call your contacts in your phone, just everyone you know that lives in the state of Ohio that can vote, make sure they have a plan to vote, make sure they've checked their voter registration, all those kinds of things. Um, we are doing postcard writing parties that will be coming up soon, um, and we get all of our materials and everything from the Ohioans United for Reproductive Rights campaign. So if you want to uh, get involved you know, on the ground, like in that way, uh, I think the best way is to follow along with the OURR campaign. And as volunteer opportunities come up, um, they'll be on their social media sites. And I'll make sure that all of our opportunities are on there as well. Uh, there is also, and I'm dropping links in the chat right now, there's also a website called Mobilize. And this is really great because multiple organizations that are involved in this effort all use Mobilize. And so every time we have... Uh, a volunteer event, whether it's virtual, um, you know, a phone bank or a text bank that people from all over the country could join in, or if it's in person, like when we do get together to go out and knock doors, it'll be on Mobilize. And when you log into Mobilize, all you have to do is allow it to use your location and it'll show you what events are near you and it'll show you all the virtual events as well. So you don't have to know what to search for, or go search for any kind of keywords or anything like that. All you have to do is go on to Mobilize and I'm dropping the link right now, mobilize.us. Um, you go on there and it'll show you volunteer opportunities near you. Um, with Labor Day coming up with this holiday weekend, this is kind of where this is our last moment of catching our breath and from the August election and getting all of our campaign plan and materials together. And I think the plan is uh, after next week to really start hitting the ground hard. So uh, you'll be hearing a lot more from our volunteers out in the field very soon. And we're just going to go nonstop for the 60 some 70 days uh, until election day and make sure that people get out and vote yes on issue one in November. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everybody. I think Sam, let me, there you are. Um, we have, I think one question that maybe we could throw out to everyone um, and see who has the answer. Yes, so Heather in the chat asked, what is being done to include Ohio A1 and ACNM members in these advocacy measures? So maybe punt that to Daniel or Dr. Acevedo to, to start off with. Yeah, happy to, you know, and so um, a really important piece here, um, particularly when it comes to messaging, right, um, is making sure that we have messengers that are reflective of both uh, the population we treat as well as the, you know, provider population. And so that is something that we actively look for um, throughout the, in, the entire time is both folks that represent all races as well as all, all healthcare aspects. Um, and so that is something that we've reached out to. Um, we have a few APRNs and a few uh, CNMs um, that are part of that messaging system. Um, but at the same time, we are welcoming anyone um, and everyone. And so I'm not sure that those that those specific organizations um, have endorsed a ballot initiative yet. And it's you know a slow process through going every organization. They are all like, 
they all have their own internal process on how to approve, um, a, you know, an endorsement and how to be able to put out um, their own communications. And so I'm not sure where we are on the status of those specific organizations, um, but healthcare professionals in general, including um, midwives, as well as nurse practitioners, um, have been involved individually um, in the process is what I can tell you. Daniel, I'm not sure if you know if um, you have met with them as organizations. I know that I, that I personally have not, but it doesn't mean that there aren't conversations in the works. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. I was kind of trying to scroll through my list really quick to see if those organizations were on there. I would just say, and I can drop uh, a link in the chat um, for anybody that has an organization that wants to be part of this coalition, there is a, a form to kind of sign up to make sure that you're clued in on everything that's going on with the campaign. So let me drop that link in the chat. Thank you both. Um, and I'll just say briefly that Jesse and I are both in coalition with A1 and ACNM uh, staff. And so, um, you know, have shared this webinar with them and uh, share other opportunities in general for folks to get involved. So as we hear of uh, volunteer opportunities, we'll make sure that your staff folks also hear of them. And um, we don't have any more questions in the queue, but wanna see if anyone else has something they'd like to ask, whether typing in the Q&A feature, or I believe if you raise your hand, I'm able to unmute you. So leaving space for folks to ask questions. I'm going to go ahead and say that the fact there's no questions means that our panelists did a really comprehensive job. We, they pre-answered the questions. Yeah. Seeing no more Q&As and seeing no hands up, I think <laughs> yeah. it's a great time to wrap. Um, I want to thank our panelists so much for joining us and just for all of the amazing work that they're doing in Ohio, really making a huge difference and hopefully... Um, we'll see yet another successful ballot measure come November. We have contact information here for you, both for Jesse and myself, as well as for Daniel, if you'd like to contact him directly about getting involved. And um, yeah, we're just so grateful you all could join us. And thank you so much. <laughs>